setting up a you know, JBoss CSB or a JBoss app server cluster. You really have to have engineering folks who are very proficient in that. But then there's the next level, you know, how to develop services on top of that, right? And you know, a process, let's say change management process around middleware, uh, you know, mom, right? So just messaging, you know, how do you create new topics, new queues? A lot of organizations don't have those processes in place and they're getting into the SOA business kind of blind. So again, you know, they're kind of our experiences, our scars are to their benefit at this point, right? So they're, they, they view us as really a strategic partner and they're, you know, they're setting the strategy and, you know, the strategy is out there, but they're letting us kind of drive a lot of these processes. Um, when people start, you talk about practical SOA. Do um, you, are you maybe defining just a handful of services? What are some of the first services that a typical company, maybe a typical financial service company implements? Um, well, the exercise is quite simple. I mean, it, I, I know there is a lot of kind of black magic that's associated with it, but the, the pattern that we use is really, we break up, we break up an enterprise really into a set of domain. Uh, there is really usually a product domain, what the company sells or the services that the company provides. There's back office domain, as, as you know, all the back office processes. Uh, there is an architecture domain, which includes usually services like security and caching, stuff that's non-functional. And probably a few more domains. And then usually we define a set of services, uh, products are usually what you, what you attack first. You define, you end up having very few services in this area. So for instance, for um, a financial company, things like trades, uh, you know, financial statements are really at the core of their business. You know, they're really about trades. For an insurance, a health insurance provider, you know, things like enrollment are at the core of their business. So that exercise can be done, you know, kind of in a very agile manner. And if you can validate it, you know, with the business, you can move into like next stages quite rapidly. You know, pick, up, pick out a pilot project and actually implement SOA in the context of that project. I see. <clears throat> so you talked about data models a little bit too. How important are canonical models for you know implementing SOA, oh, and, and how do you and how do you guide people when, when you get into the data aspect of it? It's it's actually key. It's very often overlooked because when you come into an enterprise and they're saying, well, we have some sort of service-oriented architecture. Essentially, they have probably a point-to-point -point set of web services that are in place that are basically bottom-up, let's say Java to XML type of re data representations, which is essentially very brittle and a very point-to-point -point type of representation. It's not SOA, right? It's essentially, it looks like a store procedure almost, right? So canonical models are very important because this is how you communicate with your services, be that through messaging, through events, or web services. Uh, usually we steer our clients to an industry standard. Pretty much in every one of the domains there is an industry standard. For instance, in credit space uh, there's XBRL, in financial, there's uh, FPML. Mm -hmm. In the uh, insur you know, provider side, there is HRXML. You take that as a base, and it pretty much satisfies 80% of what um, the client needs. And you know, there might be some extensions, but it saves a lot of money to the client in terms of they don't have to define stuff from scratch. And it kind of you know, basically prepares them to step into that you know, next level of SOA. So are you, are, are you creating, when, you, when you're defining some of these services, do they tend to break down very granular? So you might have sort of very granular data transformation services and then business services built on top of that to make composites. I mean, how are you generally instructing your clients to, you know, to create, if you're gonna create a patient, you know, a patient record service or an enrollment service, what does that typically look like? Well, the services that we define at the first level are called atomic services. And these are fairly coarse grain uh, level representations of the business, let's say, either data entities, so for instance, things like enrollment, right? The things that you can do with enrollment. It would have an operation set associated with the enrollment procedure. So this is what we call atomic services, right? They really define the business, what the business does. And you know, typically we see our clients wanting to get into this business process management right off the bat, and they say, well, you know, let's create business processes around, even without having the atomic services in place. So we kind of, you know, take a step back and say, here's really the atomic stuff. This is the core, what you need, either these are data services. We keep it very coarse grain for, you know, just because we'll get more reuse out of them uh, down the line. And then, you know, the next step would be creating composite processes on top of those composite services. So we kind of pace our clients and say, hey, don't buy that new BPM software just yet. Let's kind of get the house in order. And this is part of also, you know, kind of practical perspective, right? Because we've seen it done both ways. and. You know, you don't want to end up with an EI BPM scenario where it's just you know, unmanageable. What do you think is the most common mistake that companies